and AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Hello, everybody. So welcome to this edition of XY Live. Uh, we've got Michael back uh, speaking with us today. And How's it going, everyone? How you doing, Michael? The, um, the session today, we're looking at uh, the quest for fulfillment uh, at work. So we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at the employee side and also the employer side because it's, it's very much a two-sided uh, equation uh, and everyone's got to um, uh, hold their end of the bargain for everyone to have a good time in the office place. So Michael, um, before, before, before we commence, uh, I'd just like uh, to mention that there's been some amazing discussions going on in the Facebook group. Like the, the documentation and things that people have been sharing in the Facebook group have been amazing. And I think a lot of people are really uh, valuing those contributions and the, the sharing attitude of other practices and advisors that have been doing that. So keep it up, guys. Everyone appreciates it. Uh, just another note: we've got a we've got a great uh, session coming up in Sydney in in November. Keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, be put out on the Facebook group. And in terms of uh, today, let's let's hear a bit more about Michael. Michael Michael works with uh, business uh, as a business coach um, with some great practices around Australia. Michael, you mind sharing a bit about what you do? Yeah, I um, so a lot of you might know me as previously working for the Social Advisor. Uh, last year I moved on from there and at the end of last year decided to start my own consulting business and um, not necessarily in any sort of big grand here's a website here's a business name kind of way but um, I was sitting at home waiting for a bolt of inspiration for what to do next and uh, amazingly it didn't come uh, I, don't, I don't think good ideas tend to come that way so I went you know what I'm gonna get back out there and help businesses and do what I love most and uh, just trust that the next steps will take care of themselves so uh, really what I'm doing now is very much based around client experience and, uh, you know, kind of working out exactly where a business needs the help in that area the most. Um, I've got a, a bit of a diagnosis process I go through with businesses to, to work that out. And then I, uh, I give them, I suppose, a, f a fresh perspective and help them see their blind spots and improve their client experience wherever it needs it the most. Yeah, I've talked to some of your clients and uh, some really good stuff. They're some of the best practices in Australia that he's been working with. So you've been doing a good job. With, with, uh, with your journey to get to this um, stage of your career or business, uh, Michael, what are, what are some of the things you've done on the way to get here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, being asked to, to be on this XY Live is a huge honour. So thanks to you guys for having me on here. Uh, I... I kind of wanted to come on less as like a guru saying, oh, guys, I've got a 10 step process and it's going to revolutionize your practice. Uh, I think the value I'm going to bring to this one is more that I've been on a journey of being really unhappy at work um, and quite miserable when I was in the financial advice world and taking some really decisive steps to, to put myself in a better position where I'm like insanely fulfilled and, and uh, happy with what I'm doing now and, uh, you know, not coincidentally, I think I'm helping more people than I ever have. So I think those things go hand in hand and I'll be talking about that today. But uh, yeah, it all started out for me, you know, as it typically does, applying for grad jobs at the end of uni. Um, I was lucky enough to, to snare a position on the grad program at Westpac and did a few rotations and whatnot and got to the end of that. And you know, it's probably always inevitable, but my whole life I'd been working in um, small businesses with my family and I'd just always been surrounded by small business. I think it was, it, I wasn't really going to last long in the corporate world. I think I, I like the underdog and I, I like, I like having a really close connection between what you're doing and the people it's affecting. So uh, I, I was very lucky actually. I, I left Westpac and uh, got a job at uh, a place in Sydney called PSK, um, very large AMP financial planning practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, about a week later, the GFC hit, but I'd already signed my contract, so I was pretty lucky, I think. Uh, but, you know, I, I, was, I thought I wanted to be a financial advisor, and so I was, was on that journey of, um, you know, there's two ways. You can either start in admin or you can start in power planning and work your way up. Do you remember the point where you decided it was a good idea to be in financial advice and be a financial advisor? Yeah, good question. So I think I, 
On the grad program, the, the expect, you do three rotations and the expectation is um, you'll probably like one of them and not like the other two and then you just try and get a job in the one that you liked. I got to the end and, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person who always finds things to enjoy. So I didn't dislike any of them, but I could just tell that being kind of 20 layers removed from the, the customers of the bank just wasn't really what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I remember... Um, on one of my rotations, they put me in a Westpac branch for a couple of months. And that was my favorite part of the whole year because you were meeting people and, you know, fist bumping the security guard on the way into the branch. And you know, I liked to like being on the ground and, and seeing the real, I don't know, the real impact that this was having on people and, and being at the coalface. But, um, you know, it was probably fortuitous at the time. My dad was sharing an office with a financial advisor. Um, I used to bump into him a lot and I think he probably, you know, was, was trying to convince me to, to enter the industry, but made sense, you know, it was something that I'd seen the, the value of in my own family, that the difference it made to my family's life. And I just thought it ticked a lot of boxes. So I thought I'd give it a crack. So, and this is, this is during the heydays of financial advice where compliance was um, a lot less cumbersome than what it is today, I guess. So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was- um, More relatively appealing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember like it was so such good experience. I, I was really happy I had it. But when I was in the Westpac branch, like, they'd give me a list of customers who had over a hundred thousand in the term deposit and I was just cold calling them. So you know, I had some uh, I had some awesome experiences which I, I feel like a lot of younger people in the industry don't necessarily get today. Yeah, I was having I was having a good chat with uh, the student engagement uh, people at the FPA yesterday and discussing ways because they're, they're forecasting that there's going to be a huge gap in the number of advisors to the number of people. Like, I, arguably, well, actually, I, my opinion is that there's a huge gap as it is already in terms of the amount of people mm. who need advice and the amount of advisors out there. But if we look at the drop-off that is likely coming with all the um, education requirements and just general um, transition of people to retirement, um, there's a bigger gap. So they're, they're really concerned from a strategic standpoint how are we going to get more people into advice? And there's a lot of, there's a big, um, there's a lot of things in the way of someone becoming a financial advisor these days. It's really like, like you're saying that like your experience sort of warranted, it got you a bit closer to those steps, but not everyone's going through that same path. So it's, uh, yeah, that's, it's an interesting space. What would you, for, for anyone out there in terms of like they thought about uh, becoming a financial advisor, what would be your number one tip for them to just jump in and, um, get experience and what would be your suggested journey? Um, you know, it's something I've used a lot throughout my career. And um, I think it's one of the most underrated things that you can do when you're interested in something. And that's just being willing to donate your time. So, um, you know, I'll probably share more of my journey of starting out as a power planner and now being a business coach, like how the hell did I go from there to there? Um, but, you know, when I was working at PSK in Sydney and um, I started having these, uh, you know, I suppose just some, some intuitive feelings towards what I might be wanting to do. It wasn't like I then just did a course and then applied for a job and got it. Um, I actually reached out to Baz from the social advisor who at the time, like, you know, there really wasn't a business there. It was before advisor edge had even started. And he was just this guy who had some really interesting ideas about how financial advisors can use technology. Um, and I reached out to him and just said, look, mate, I could tell you're a startup. Um, I know you probably don't have a lot of resources, but I've got free time and I've got heaps of passion. So if there's anything you want to do, just sling some work my way. And, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of young people, I'm going to sound like one of those old people who, you know, criticizes the younger generation here, but, you know, there is that thing. I don't think it's necessarily a generational thing. I think it's just a, a life experience thing that sometimes we want all the good things without putting, putting up with the crap to get there. So, you know, if you want experience in a financial advice practice, you know, ring five financial advice practices and just say that you're happy to donate your time to them. Um, you know, I'm sure one of them will, will show some interest and be able to come up with something for you. And you know, that'd be the best way to demonstrate value, see if you really like it, um, and you know, build that kind of that that connection and that relationship, which will always lead to something else. Yeah, I'm completely behind you on that one. That's a bit like how I got into financial advice. I sort of got suggested to do a diploma of financial planning while I was at university or, or uh, RG146 and because it would give me some opportunities and I did it and then um, I didn't quite use it. And I was like, wait a second, I did this thing. I want to go use it. So I called around um, and applied to a whole lot of advice practices and I'm sitting there with no experience trying to put myself in front of them and eventually got something, which was, it was just the persistence that, um, mm. that got me there. Yeah, you got to play the long game. You can't expect everything too quickly. You got to 
yeah, you just got to be patient. I think that's a really underrated characteristic as well. Yeah. So, so when you, when you're in these, uh, like going on this journey and sort of towards, uh, like became, got into an advice firm and you realized you got to a point, there was a turning point. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah, there was, there was actually. So, I w- you know, there's, there's always that thing, like I said before, that if you want to be an advisor, you either start in admin or you start in power planning. I've done a lot of the admin at Westpac. So I went, okay, well, now I'll just kind of get technical and then that'll round my skill set and I'll become an advisor. Um, and, you know, you mentioned compliance before. And you know, this is one of those things I often look back on and go, geez, how different things could have been. And not, not in a regretful way, but uh, I remember just looking at the changes to the industry and the compliance and I suppose all the red tape that was getting you know, put in front of advisors and going, I actually think financial advice is going to get to a point where it'll be so expensive that it won't be able to help the people who probably need it the most. And at the time, that was when I went, well, this isn't what I want to do. And I feel like if I'd had the exact same set of experiences now, but, you know, 10 years older, I probably would have done what a lot of XY advisors have done, which is take that on as a bit of a challenge and go, how can we do this in a way that's going to help the people who need it most in a really scalable and efficient way, but still in a really meaningful way. So I probably just took the easy option in many respects, but I I, I got to a point and I, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I just knew this wasn't it. And I, I actually went on a holiday to Europe for four weeks and I, I said to myself, you know, I've got four weeks, I'm going to give this a really good thought and I'm going to come back and I'm going to have a plan. And, um, you know, I went with a couple of mates, you know, we went to the UK, went to Spain for this festival, um, you know, stopped in Japan. Like it was, it was a typical like, you know, boys holiday. And I spent absolutely none of that four weeks thinking about work. Like I just had a really good time. And um, I remember being at the airport on the way home and I was actually really disappointed in myself. I'm like, you've given yourself this, this big opportunity to, to, you know, work out what you're doing next. And it's probably the most important thing in your life right now. And you've just, you know, got distracted by shiny objects and um, hadn't given it any time. And um, How old most, were you then? I was 20, I was 26. 26, yeah. formative years. Those yeah, years. absolutely. Well, I know I was 26 because that was the year the Dragons won the grand final. So I'm not going to forget that one in a hurry. Um, but yeah. That memory the way things are going. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah, probably be another 26 years, I think. Um, but yeah, so I was literally, I was at Heathrow Airport. I was, I was a bit down in the dumps just going, you know, in three days time, I'm going to be back in that seat that I don't really want to be in. Um, great company, fantastic people, but it, it just wasn't, I just knew it wasn't for me. And uh, it, it sounds like a, a movie moment, really, but I, I was walking through the airport and there was a news agent and I just saw this book sitting up there and it said, screw work, let's play. And I went, geez, that, that sounds interesting. So I wandered over to it and I read the back cover and I remember just having like this burst of energy at the time going, oh my God, like this book is talking to me. You know, we, we've all had that situation where something just seems like it's written for you at that moment. Um, and I bought it and I, I kind of just started as I was walking to the gate, you know, I was literally about to board the flight, just flicking through it. And as I started seeing the, the titles of the chapters and I suppose what the whole book was all about, I just, I just knew the power I had in my hands. And um, I spent the whole flight home reading it and got home and I had a bit of a plan. And the plan wasn't, this is what I'm going to be doing next, but the plan was, was really around um, not being so serious about all of this stuff. And, you know, as a kid, right, we... Play in the was, sand was pit. Was this at Amsterdam Airport at all? Uh, no, it was. It was. It was Heathrow. <laughs> it was Heathrow. <laughs> all of a sudden, you weren't that serious at all. And yeah, no, well, yeah, no, could be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it was really the the whole premise of the book is as kids we just play and we don't think. Well, why am I going to sit in this sand pit and pour sand on a truck and then bury the truck and then try and find the truck? Um, we don't do that thinking that there's a logical reason to do it. We do it because in that moment, that's what feels right. Um, it's what we want to be doing. And we're just trusting our instincts because we just want to learn. And then as we get adults, you know, as we get to becoming adults, we, we stop doing that. So, um, you know, you, you just get more serious about things and you only invest your time doing things that make sense. And, um, we kind of lose that ability to play and to, to listen to ourselves about what we love doing and what we're excited about because we're just clouding it with all this other stuff. And so really the, the word they use is defrosting and I really like that because I think we get frozen in what we're doing and it is about defrosting and just kind of just, just 
you know, doing things that don't really make sense but just seem fun um, and learning along the way because you always learn along the way when you do those things. Um, and then in my case, you know, my play project was I loved hanging out with my mates. Um, I mentioned before I've always loved underdogs. I've always loved the, the parts of the world that, the, that don't get that much attention. Um, and so what I did, I got three mates together and we used to go out to these like random obscure festivals. So like at one of the ones we went to like a rockabilly festival, um, but not like a big one at like, you know, Homebush with like 5,000 people. They were talking like some community hall in Chatswood with like 80 people, you know? So like these kind of random little obscure things and we'd film these documentaries on them and um, get to know the people. And, you know, it was kind of funny. It was just really a good excuse to hang out with my mates. Um, but have a bit of fun along the way and kind of, you know, produce something that was interesting. Was this for a competition or anything? Or? No, no, I just, I read the book. I actually ended up doing a course on the back of the book and I had to come up with a project and launch it during the course. And so that was the one that I came up with. And, um, you know, my mates, we just went along for the ride because it was good fun. Um, but the things I learned along the way were like how to build a website, um, what camera to buy, what... Um, what microphone to use. You know, the first videos we did, we didn't have a microphone, it sounded crap, so then we had to get a microphone. Um, you know, how to edit videos, how to put stuff on YouTube, how to build Facebook pages, how to get people to watch your videos. And so here I am in this financial advice practice that I knew had to solve all those problems and there was no one there who could solve them. And here I was on the other side doing all this stuff in my free time and then all of a sudden I went, oh, hold on a sec, I can bring all those new skills and help you guys out. And that's what ended up happening. Um, and I was really fortunate that the CEO of the company decided to create a role for me. He's like, you know, we need this stuff. They had like 35 practices and no CRM system. Like, um, yeah, so th sorry, 35 advisors in there, no CRM system. So, you know, they needed a tech, a lot of, a lot of paper and uh, not much ability to market to people or just, you know, stay in touch and contact them. You know, there was, um, it was just a, an amazing opportunity. And so, you know, I, I kind of had that nerdish techie skill on one side and then all these other things. So they, be, they, they made me the digital marketing manager and you know, the rest is history. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, this is, that's, sort of, um, that's the sort of thing that I've talked to a few, uh, quite a lot of people about in terms of having that tech champion in your business. Mm. It's, uh, you became that guy. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, it got to a point where um, I... You know, the, the business probably went from there to there in terms of tech and they weren't, you know, really willing or, or even, you know, excited about going to the next level and that's fine as well. Um, and so that was the point where I went, okay, well, maybe it's time to go move on to do something different. But, you know, to go through that experience, you know, I, I helped them a lot, but, you know, just as importantly, they helped me, you know, get back in touch with what I love doing and get a lot closer to that fulfillment, which was lacking. Mm. So, so did the practice see, like off the back of some of the changes that you went through with them, were they seeing quite a financial difference in terms of like the bottom line and what the outcomes that were coming through the practice? Yeah, it's a good, good point because I think, you know, I was, when I was getting obsessed with this stuff, I was studying a lot of traditional wisdom, which was, you know, you need a big brand and people trust the brand and all of these things. And so a lot of what I did in the first place was like, top down, I would call it. So it was all about PSK as a brand. Um, but what I discovered through that, and you know, this is a big part of it too, is I didn't just have all the answers and implement them and then all of a sudden we're making money and happily ever after. But I made a lot more mistakes there and that was great. And that was one of the big ones I made was um, realizing that it wasn't about the business, it's about the people. And, uh, you know, that's why I connected so well with the vision of the social advisor um, because, you know, in that world, it was really, it's all about you and you've got to become a personal brand. And it sounds so obvious now. Everyone's like, yeah, that's obvious. But at the time, no one was talking about that. Like they knew that their business was all about relationships, but what was happening online was so different. They, you know, people weren't using video. People weren't putting themselves out there. It was, uh, it was a very different world. And so I suppose, you know, the results that I got weren't so much about like the whole business generated this, but it was really about working with individual advisors at PSK, um, some of whom are in the XY advisor group now and working on their own individual marketing plan, which, which did yield results for them. Mm, yeah, great. So like, I guess for everyone listening, it's what we're really talking about is uh, what 
what practices can get out of like this sort of discussion, but also what um, the employees. So it's a very, very much a two-sided coin that we're um, walking along here. Cause I think some of the insights out of like Michael's experience around um, the benefit he was able to sort of provide in the practice after he was given the opportunity and discovered he was quite passionate about a certain space. Um, and he was let loose to an extent and uh, be able to do that. Um, rewarded him, but also the practice at the same time. So like, I guess for people, um, so for the, for the people listening that are actually working in advice practices, um, what from a thought process and like maybe a way to sort of think about if they are really hitting their values in how they're operating. And um, I, know, I know some, some practices probably out there going, don't, don't, don't get, give my guys ideas. I don't want them leaving. Um, <laughs> We're going to do it anyway. What do those people that are sort of unsure if they're really working towards their, working with their values? So, uh, sorry, uh, do you mean if uh, like the employers or the employees? It, like the employees who, in this, yeah, for this question. Yeah. yeah. So look, I think ultimately we know if we're happy at work. Like we, it, it's that thing of are you hitting the snooze button or are you just pumped to go in there? Um, when you're at a party and someone asks you, how's work? We all know that feeling where we're like, oh, I don't want to talk about work. I'm at this party because I want to forget about work. I mean, they're the warning signs where you go, you, something's wrong. Something's got to change. Um, and that, that goes with any area of your life, right? You, you kind of know at any point in time how you're feeling about it. Um, I think, you know, one of the, so, so I think, you know, if you're, for me, it's like, it's really a case of value and, I think, you know, believe in whatever you want, the universe, religion, whatever. But I think nature, if we just want to call it that, has rigged it. So, like, the more value we're giving to the world, the more we get back in terms of energy and fulfilment and clarity. Sometimes money, that, that's part of it as well. Um, but it's not always part of it. We just, it's that energy. So, if, you, if you're low energy about your job, you're, you're not really clear on why you're even there. Um, that's a sign that you're not giving as much value as you should. So, really, it's just about... Do you feel like you're giving as much value to this place as possible? And if you feel like there's way more that you could be giving, that's that's a sign something's got to change. Mm. Um, so on the, what about on the employer side of things? Like in terms of, I guess, at, at their level, in terms of them feeling whether they're getting value or they're delivering value to their employees. Um, what about that side of things? Yeah, I think it's, um, so I often look at Google, you know, that they're, they're they're well known as a company that, that just hire amazingly and, and build an amazing culture. Um, one of the things that is like at, at, at yes or no when they're hiring people is do they have side projects? Do they have um, other things in their life that they're working on? Not because they're looking to build the next Facebook or whatever the case may be, but because they're just genuinely curious and genuinely interested. Um, and you think about that, like if you're just working on something just because it's fun and you're doing it in your spare time, it shows that you don't see work as a chore. It shows that you see work as an extension of yourself. So that's a tip. Is that the 20% time or whatever they... Well, that, that's what they build in internally. But what I'm talking about here is while they're hiring. So, you know, this is like before they've even met someone. Um, but that person's happy to fail and make a mistake and then learn from it and move on. That person is um, leaving their comfort zone. Like there's so many things that says about someone. And I think it's important because like, and Seth Godin talks about this and I really like the concept that we have a comfort zone and we have a safety zone. And 50 years ago, if you were in your comfort zone at work, you were probably also in a zone where you were fine. Like you just keep your head down, you do your job. And it doesn't matter if you're pushing yourself because you got that job in the factory and you're doing that, your little part of the process. And really you just don't, don't ruffle any feathers, don't make any changes and you'll, you know, get paid and you'll live your good life and then you'll be able to retire. Mm -hmm. um, but what Seth talks about is how those two things are becoming completely different. And the, the, uh, the most safe, or I should say the least unsafe place to be is outside your comfort zone because the world today requires us to leave our comfort zone and to learn quicker than ever, to adapt quicker than ever. And if we're just playing it safe and doing what we've always done, um, we're, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to be in the danger zone in the future. So I think as an employer, I'd be firstly looking for people who are prepared to leave their comfort zone because really by extension as a business, you're either, if you're not out of your comfort zone now, 
you're going to need to be very soon. Otherwise, you're not going to be relevant in years to come. So I think it's about bringing in the right people who are prepared to do that. Um, obviously, with any change like that, you might have some people in your team who just aren't prepared to leave their comfort zone. And, you know, that's a, that's a challenge. But um, really, as a business, you just got to kind of put your foot down and go, well, now's the time to, to build a culture and to build a business that, that relies on people to try new things and to bring them their best self to work and to, to do things that we can't even imagine um, because, you know, we're tapping into the natural strengths and passions of the people in our team. Well, what, so what are your suggestions? Is it so, like setting aside 10% of um, someone's work time to go, this is your tinkering time, go improve our practice somehow, however you want? And um, yeah, that, I think, what are your suggestions? I think for some businesses, that's, a, that's an awesome idea. Um, I don't think there's like a one size fits all approach here, but um, you know, I, so anyone who I work with um, or has read my blogs, they, they might have heard of this one, but I always talk about the success triangle. Um, this is this, it, it's got a very wanky name. I'm going to put my hand up and say that now, uh, but it works. And basically the whole idea of the success triangle is in order to be successful at anything, you need three things in balance. You need clarity, you need capability, and you need motivation. So in other words, you've got to know what you're doing, you've got to be able to do it, and you're going to want to do it. So if we wanted to apply that methodology to this, I think you know, there's work that needs to happen on each side of the triangle. So clarity wise, you need to set an expectation with the team that you're not just here to do what's on your job description. We, we want you to push yourself and uh, we want you to try things that are not necessarily on your job description, but that interest you and that you're passionate about. Um, and we also want you and, you know, some of the best businesses in the practice, uh, sorry, in the industry are doing this. Uh, is actually setting expectations around achieving personal goals. So, you know, when it comes time to sit down and do that performance appraisal, yeah, okay, you're seeing enough clients and you're bringing in this revenue, but how are you growing? Now, you told me at the start of the year that you wanted to achieve this. Um, how have you gone with that? And you know, there's a fantastic book which Peter Diamantidis put me onto called The Dream Manager, which is all about this. Um, it's, a, it's a real story about a cleaning company that brought someone in whose job it was to help the people in the business achieve their own goals. And, you know, you could almost say as a financial advice practice, it would be hypocritical to be telling the world that we're going to be here to help you achieve your goals, but then with your own team, you're not helping them do it. So for Absolutely. me, that's about, a, that, that's the clarity side of things is like setting that as the expectation that people like us do things like this, which is achieve things outside of work and bring themselves to work, you know, along the way. Um, so then we move on to capability, which is like, yeah, that's knowledge and things like that. Um, but one of the biggest parts of capability is time. And that's where your 10% time or whatever you want to call it is really important is, you know, not just saying to everyone, look, do your job and do 40 hours a week. And then any other time outside of your five days, you can work on your own things, like actually carving out that time. And for some businesses, it's just about like, an agreement that it's okay to be working on things like that. Um, but for others, it might be right every Friday afternoon when you usually clock off mentally anyway. Let's do something fun so you end the week on a positive note. Yeah, so so are you talking a bit like about the business culture in an essence? Like it's sort of like obviously you've got, you can do this, oh, I sit down and we talk about um, their outside of work goals and that's sort of the thing that you're doing. But I feel that you're talking about like what, what um, sort of environment are you setting the business to be in? Is that, is that something that, um, is that something that links back to like the values of the business? So like the mission statement and all that sort of that process that businesses can go through. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, you know, the values to me are just how we crystallize what the, the way we all choose to act in this business. Uh, you know, and one of the best things about values is it doesn't mean that, it means that if I can see something is compromising one of those values, rather than me go, I've got a problem with you, you can actually externalize that feedback and go, actually, you're you know, not acting in line with those values. Um, but, you know, for some businesses, um, you know, growth and learning or basically stretching yourself and being better tomorrow than you are today is one of those values. So, you know, this is, if you look at values, really all it is is setting the, the goalpost for your team and going, here's what we expect from you. And so if this sort of thing's important enough to you, like it, it should become a value. Um, and really what the culture is, is just 
everything that happens within a business to make sure that everyone's in line with those values. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so there's, like I said before, there's a lot of levers that you can pull here to, to make that happen. But I think values are, that, that first and foremost, that's where you start because um, values affect the way that you hire people. So if you have a list of really clear, this is what people like us are like, um, it makes that hiring decision a lot easier. You can either go, that person's not like us or yeah, they are like us. Mm. Um, so yeah, j j just you know, bringing people on in that way is so powerful, but then it also becomes the way that you, you know, the best businesses I know in the industry measure performance against the values. Um, they have meetings based on living the values. Um, yep. They might take one of those values and go, right, we're not doing this well as a business, so that's going to become a project that we're working on. And is that, is that do these businesses use those, reference those values in the day-to-day -day, um, operation of the business? So, for example, um, something they see that's going on in the advice process and they pick up on it, um, do they reference and say, well, that doesn't match the values that we've set? Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, I mean, you can at a really simple. That's it. Yeah, living it like it, it can become a checklist almost of like, are we on track or are we not? Um, yeah. So, oh, has so super's been submitted. We've sent the application off, but um, have have we actually um, implemented something that matches the values of the business? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, if if one of your values was, you know, we we do think what we make things as easy as they can be. Well, all of a sudden that becomes a way that someone in the team can put their hand up and go, I actually don't think this process is as easy as it could be. Mm. Uh, and yeah, like I said, it's not someone's opinion and then they feel defensive. It's you're externalizing it against that value. Yeah. So it's almost like um, it's not making it between people in the business. And I guess this is good for whether it's business partners, managers and, and staff, et cetera, but you've got a reference point in the middle of people, which isn't making it about me and you it's a making it about this, what we've agreed to. So it's like a, um, an intermediary that allows for, I guess, prevents, prevents uh, maybe emotion and other factors that can come in to play and makes things clear, as you're saying before. That's exactly right. And so, you know, you might have two scenarios. You might be a brand new business with no team members. You go, oh, well, there's no point having values. Well, actually make those calls now and set what the values are. And then when you hire people and they, you know, in the first interview, they're aware of the values, that becomes like the guiding light for them throughout their whole time at the company where they've known that since the start. And, you know, you're basically making sure that they're really well aligned from day one. Mm. Um, but for businesses that don't have values, um, but they've got maybe a bigger team, mm -hmm. imagine a process. And I've done, done this with a couple of my clients where we actually bring them all together and decide what their values are. Uh, imagine how powerful that is that not only are you all agreeing what they are, but then, the, you know, if I've helped decide on that value, I'm so much more likely to live in line with that value because I feel that ownership over it as well. Yeah. So, like, I guess some business will probably be listening to this and going, well, we've never done that before. Um, we don't know what our values are. What, what are the ways, I guess, what would be the steps that they could do to um, achieve that, get something in place? Yeah. So, look, I think... Um, I think when we do this, like at the end of the day, if you own a business, the business becomes a reflection of you. So you couldn't just leave it up to the team to come up, come up with the values because ultimately you're the one who everything lands with and uh, you know, the, the business is, is yours for the foreseeable future. So there has to be, I suppose, a a weight, and I wouldn't say like a 90% weight, but they're probably, as an owner in a business, your voice probably needs to be a tiny bit louder than everyone else's because it is your business and you need to make sure that what the business agrees to be like is consistent with what's most important to you and the type of business you're trying to build. Yeah, so, because I've gone through, I did a bit of that process with my guys and it was, it was hard. Like I was doing my best to not be the dominant one and give them ownership. But I guess um, what you're saying is that you shouldn't try to really avoid that. It's still, it's got to be in there. Like you can't, you are the dominant player because you own the business. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't say though, like if you went in with a message like that, I feel like the team would just be like, well, you know, what we say doesn't matter here. Yeah. Um, so what I've actually done, and you know, this isn't a subtle plug for someone like me, but I feel like bringing in someone externally um, is a really good idea here because they can almost be like a referee in the discussion. 
Um, once you've explained to the, the team, so bring them all together and explained what values are, because a lot of people kind of, you know, get, get like a fuzzy idea of values, but don't really um, understand it. So, you know, giving some examples and showing them some, some good sets of values from other businesses without leading the witness. Um, what I've done in the past, though, is gone through that exercise with the leaders of a business first, then come up with their list of values. We actually have it up on a flip chart and cover it up so no one can see it. We then go for the rest of the team, business, business owner or owners need to keep their mouth shut for this bit. And as a team, uh, we come up with what is most important to them in the way that they do their job. And uh, then you come up with a list, you know, is this one, this one's pretty similar to that. So what wording do we think is better? Look, if we do it this way, by default, we're going to do these three so we can cross out those three because that one's the most important one. So you kind of go through that process of getting the list. And then so reconciling them. Yeah, reconciling them, exactly. And then once you've kind of got that nice pruned list, then you can actually reveal the leader's set of values and compare them. And, you know, you, you're going to have to trust me on this, but whenever I've done this, you'd be astounded how similar the lists are. Uh, and when there's a discrepancy, again, we go through that reconcile process. It's not like, oh, you know, that was really fun that you guys went through that, but we're going with the business owner's list. We actually go, well, you know, let, let's, let's negotiate both ways here. So there's two values on the business owner's list that weren't on yours. How important are they to us guys? And the, the team might go, no, they're not important for this reason. And sometimes the business, business leader can go, well, yeah, I'm happy to get rid of that one. That's fine. I can, I can live with that. So it's a bit of a negotiation, but you can imagine at the end of a process like that, everyone's had their voice heard. Everyone sees that list of values and, and has agreed on what it is. And then they can see their contribution being, being crystallized as well. It's, it's really powerful stuff. Yeah, that's, oh, I like it. I like it. With, with the employees, like, I guess this is something, this sort of process, could an employee initiate this process in a business? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I suppose this is really what my whole message is about today is that like we, as an employee, and I think I'm in a really interesting position because I've been an employee pretty recently. So I'm not down this path of being 20 years into business and I'm divorced from how employees think. I'm kind of, I've started my own venture, um, but I'm still, I still have very fresh thinking when it comes to how employees are. And I can tell you what happens, and you probably know this, but employees sit there and go, I can't believe that we're not doing this or how stupid that we're doing this and not this. And, mm. you know, employees are tuned in. They're, they're doing this day in, day out. But the problem is, and it's kind of like when I was in financial advice and seeing what was wrong with it and then that made me decide not to become a financial advisor, I just didn't empower myself or didn't feel empowered to go, I can do something about this. And so as an employee... Um, you know, you see the things that aren't there, but we almost, you know, and probably unfairly expect the leaders of a business to know, be mind readers or to see all of these gaps. But yeah. I think it's like that. You've actually got a responsibility then. If you see a gap, you, you've got a responsibility to bring it to someone's attention and do something about it. The fact that you've seen it and you can't believe anyone else hasn't seen it, that might be a sign that you've actually got some really good intuition here and that's a gift you can give the business because no one else has noticed it yet. Um, but we talked about responsibility. Well, there's also th what I'm talking here about is as a business, giving people the power to then do something about that. So you might feel the responsibility to raise issues, but then if they always just never go anywhere and you never get empowered to do something about it, that, that list of ideas that I've got for the business is going to dry up pretty quickly if I don't feel like there's any point raising them. So yeah. you've got to have the follow through. But, you know, this is one of the things I often, when I was at the social advisor, I, I used to tell people was the big difference was when I was in previous companies, I'd, I'd have an idea and people would go, that's a great idea, like, well done. I'd get the pat on the back and I'd feel good about myself and then it ended there. And I remember when I went to the social advisor, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Go do it. And then you're like, oh, crap. Like, I've got, I've got so much work to do now. <laughs> like, I've got my, my to-do list is long enough. Now I've got to make it longer. Um, but of course, like, you know, seeing that idea through from inception to execution and working out how to bring the, the team on board and, and to get it implemented properly and learning a million things along the way and then seeing the fruits of your labor, it's, it's 
such a rewarding experience. Um, but again, you know, it's my, my personal, the way I see the world, my experience, all of that had led me to that point where I could see that idea that someone else couldn't. And uh, I suppose my message for, for employers out there is, you know, don't, don't underestimate the value of that, that if people are complaining about things, um, why not build a culture where they then have the ability, you know, the clarity, the capability and the motivation to implement them. Um, it's, it's better for your business because you're solving problems and, and becoming better as a business, but it's insanely empowering for the employee as well. Yeah, so I'm hearing, I'm hearing two messages here. One's for the employer, one's for the employee. So for the employer, I'm hearing you've got your responsibility is to create an environment where an employee can uh, sort of push up and sort of and, and create to an extent, create something in their role, create something to tackle a problem and take, take more ownership, I guess that's what I'm hearing. Um, is, that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah, and on the employer side, I'm hearing sort of, oh, sorry, on the employee side, um, you're not just entitled for an employer to hand everything you, to you on a platter. Um, most employers, like, they, they're not able to do everything for you. Um, you. You're your own person, you've got to do, you've got to actually initiate something on your side of the fence uh, and, it's not just going to get handed to you. And if you don't ask, you don't get. So um, speak up and uh, share your ideas. And if you do that enough and no one's heard, then maybe it's a fair, fair point to move on. But I think um, not raising, raising anything and not attempting to communicate and share, share new ideas and initiative and attempt to make a change and moving on without doing that, I think that's just a cop out to on the employee side of things as well. So. Yeah, but there's also like, there's a lot of conditioning here. Like as people, we're just told to stay in our box and not speak up and, you know, think about in a classroom where someone would ask a lot of questions. They were the ones that people would tell them to shut up and, you know, they would groan. Um, you know, the, the people who put their head above everyone else and do stuff differently are often shot down in flames. So, yeah, you're right. Like, as an employee, you need to create a culture where that's the expectation. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do for the person because it's empowering, but it, it makes a lot of practical business sense too because the businesses who are full of people like that are the ones that are going to thrive. Um, but going back to the employee, I think, you know, because of that programming that I mentioned, like, the typical employee is is not that empowered. And some of, like, I think a lot of this comes down to value. It comes down to them going, my ideas aren't valuable enough or they're, they're not actually that good ideas. So I'm, I'm not gonna put myself out there and say them. And a lot of that is, is really just not believing in ourselves. So for me, like if you're sitting at your desk and you know, you're counting down the days to Friday and your weekends are the highlight of your week and then someday you're kind of dreading going into work, there's a huge disconnect. You're, you're not getting much out of work, but I'd put it back onto you as an employee and say, but how much are you giving to work? You know, how much, are you, how much of yourself are you giving to that place that you're getting it back in return? And, you know, for some people, they might go, yeah, but I don't know what I love doing and I don't know what I'm good at and I don't know what my value is. And that's, that's surprisingly common. You know, like in your case, Adrian, you're a business owner. You obviously saw enough value in what you did to go start a business. But there's a lot of people who are employees out there who who are so far removed from that because they've, you know, through through becoming an adult and maybe signing, you know, buying a house and getting a huge mortgage and not being able to do what they love, but kind of being locked into this life, you, you do lose touch of what, what brings you alive. And I look at me as a power planner, may, you know, I'm, I'd say if you asked anyone who knows me, they say that I'm, I'm talkative, um, I love speaking, I, you know, I, I give in, I'm an extrovert. Um, I lost all my confidence talking to people when I was a paraplanner because I wasn't flexing that muscle. And you now if I'd stayed in that seat for 10 years, like I'd be a, a drastically different person. So what I'm, what I'm, I suppose, as an employee, like if you're at that point where you're like, I have no idea what makes me come alive. Like I think we need to almost become life explorers and, and really start asking those questions or like, you know, what gives me fist pumps in life? You know, what, what are the things that make me more excited than anything outside of work and then using that as a clinic going, what are the things at work that I procrastinate on the most? You know, what are the things that like, I just, I avoid doing them. I'll, I'll you know, go check my phone, go get a coffee because I hate doing them because it's just as important to not do the things that you don't like as it is to do the things you love. Um, 
you know, and then just basically one of the things I business owners and employees at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Spot on. Um, but you know, just, just asking it, this, I could come up with a list of a million questions. You know, what are the things you find yourself doing in your free time, even when you don't get paid for it because you love doing it so much. And the, the whole hypothesis here for me is that it has never been a better time in the entire history of the world to be able to make a business out of what you love doing or to add value to a business based on what you love doing. Like technology has basically meant that, you know, if you were an amazing writer and you wanted to write books um, and be a journalist when you were younger, but then all of a sudden you become a financial planner, technology has meant that you can become a blogger. Um, you know, one of the, one of the examples that I've, I've got of someone I met in the UK was a lawyer who wanted to be a rock star. And so he did his lawyer, law, sorry, when he was younger, he wanted to be a rock star, smart guy, ended up doing a law degree. So he's like, well, I want to be a rock star, so I'll go become a lawyer at a, um, at a music label. And he was miserable. So he thought, well, you know, music, that's what I want to do. But no, what he wanted from that was the emotion of being in front of people and moving them. So he ended up just recording videos and he's now become like the rock star lawyer. So he's getting that same fulfillment. So it's just about getting in touch with like the things that you love doing. And you can't do that by just, you know, like I said, I sat at home waiting for that. But it doesn't happen on your own. You've got to get out there and just make things happen. You know, launch a podcast, like start doing YouTube videos. It doesn't matter. If they're, if they're not successful, you've got to just get comfortable with that because it's the journey that's the reward, as, as Steve Jobs would say. Yeah, I think one of the, touching on like the expression that you're referring to from that lawyer, I think ref, when self-expression is muffled and you feel, you've actually got something that you would actually if nothing else was stopping you, you would like to express. If you're, if you're stunted with that feeling when you, when you have it, um, that's a sign that maybe you should look at how you can express what's going on underneath. And if you're not doing it, that's when you, you're putting yourself in a position where you're not going to be enjoying what you're doing. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, the thing is, like I was sitting in that seat as a paraplanner and I probably could have sat there for 20 years, but it would have got to a point where they went, well, hold on a sec. Michael's doing X amount of plans a week and we don't get much else from him. We could outsource that to a company who'll do it twice as well in half the time because power planning is not my jam, but there's someone out there who absolutely loves power planning. And the world now as connected as we are with technology. It's easier than ever to find those people who love doing what you don't do. And like, you know, like I said, they'll do it half the time twice as well. So if you're sitting in a job now and you know that deep down, it's not what you should be doing, this is the whole comfort zone, safety zone thing is that like you're in your comfort zone, but you're in a danger zone. You're not in your safety zone anymore. So in order to be in a situation where your future is more self-assured, you actually need to leave your comfort zone. So like I think I've seen it, I've heard about it these days, like an option that you could have had would um, keep your power planning job and just find a, an assistant that you outsource to. And um, like you can just work half the week and outsource yeah. for a cheaper rate. That, that, I love that idea. <laughs> well, on that note, Mark, was there anything you wanted to share before we before we wrap up? Um, look, I, I I'll tell a story, um, and you know I don't want to go all philosophical, but I'm going to go all philosophical. Because I, I feel like this. I'm telling you this story now because it, it really reflects my experience in life. Um, and I just think for people out there who are maybe in their comfort zone, it's, it's something worth considering. So um, 2009, I went to Chile with a bunch of mates. So I, I met these awesome Chilean dudes at uni and uh, one of them was getting married. So we went over there and there was, there was kind of like 12 of us from all sorts of countries in the world. And um, we were going sandboarding. And for those of you who don't know, it's like snowboarding, but you're, you're on sand dunes. And a couple of the guys in my group were like, you know, adventurous and like high energy people. So they were like running up there and just going down and I'm actually scared of heights. Um, and so I was like procrastinating, right? Like I was walking up slowly and I was talking to people at the top and they'd go down and someone else would come up and I'd talk to them. And you know, a few of my mates have probably done five or six trips down there and I'd done none. And I, I was scared. Like I was actually really, um, I, you know, I, I just didn't want to fall over. I didn't want to hurt myself. And, you know, my, my fear of heights got kind of got knocked gotten away eventually someone saw what was happening i was like no no, no come on like come down just do it and I, f I went down and probably 20 meters later i fell and, and the sand was soft and it was warm and it actually felt 
amazing. It did not hurt and it made me realize I'd put off this thing because of in my head I'd built up how, how hard it would be but it was actually that the failing, so to speak, of falling actually felt really nice. And so after that, I just kept getting back up and going down. And when I'd kind of removed failure as being an issue, I, I stayed standing longer, but I also just really enjoyed the experience. And you know, there's a really nice parallel for what I, I have, was doing in my previous life too, this power planning job, which I wasn't loving. And, you know, I've done things since then and I've, I've left my comfort zone and I've stuffed some things up and looked like an idiot. And, but at the end of the day, like that, that experience of feeling the highs and lows of life you know, the, the lows just as much as the highs. That's, it's kind of like what it is to be human. And I think, you know, we're here for such a short amount of time that, you know, shrinking yourself down to this like job that just funds a small amount of your personal life. And you just, you realize you've got more to offer. Like life's too short to do that. And I just think um, what you're scared of or what you're worried about is probably nowhere near as scary as you think. Um, so ultimately it just comes down to what's the worst that can happen. And that's, that's if you're sitting there in your comfort zone, but, um, as a, as someone who leads people like that, you could be making a profound impact on their lives. If you give them that confidence to, to try things and to fall over a few times and learn the lessons, but really just bringing their full selves to work. Like if someone's diluting themselves and they're bringing 60% of themselves to work, if you've got a whole team doing that, like you're not getting much bang for your buck as an employer, but if you can find a way of getting people to bring 80, 90% of themselves to work, like just, just imagine the difference that would make to your business. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's almost the most human thing you can do is just be yourself. So have a crack on either side, whether you're an employee or an employer, give them a go. Absolutely. Awesome, Michael. Well, one of our more philosophical uh, sessions we've had on XY Live, the Zen, Zen master, Michael Back. <laughs> Also known as one of the nicest guys in financial advice, and I'm sure you guys have seen that today. So thank you, thank you for being on X Y Live, Michael, and um, I'm sure we'll have have you back again next year sometime. Sounds so, great. If Love anyone that. Anyone had any questions for him, follow ups to this? Just drop them in the Facebook group uh, where the X Y Live is there. Um, tag Michael; he's he's in the group there. Adds a lot of value. So um, yeah, don't be shy. Everyone awesome. have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Adrian.